Greetings of peace, everyone. My name is Shireen, and I welcome you all to Peace Vigil's program on the biological and anthropological understanding of the support to fascist leaders. Our resource person today is Samir Dosani from Peace Vigil. He is pursuing his PhD in anthropology from the University of Western Cape, South Africa. His focus for some years has been the impact of nutrition and our environment on physical and mental health. He studies dietary and behavioral changes in our evolutionary journey as human beings and links them to problems humans have faced in their individual health and also societal issues of injustice and violence. Samir has worked as campaign director of maternal health at the Amnesty International United States of America and has for some years now been practicing as a certified health coach. Now we're going to begin and I just want to leave you with this image as we begin. It is a simple understanding of why there is uh, support for hate, why there's support for fascism. And this understanding is too simplistic. So as peace educators, we want to tell you that this is the general understanding of why it, there is this problem. We, we say, oh, there's fear and you mix fear with ignorance and that's how you get hate. And that's why many of us, when there is Islamophobia, we start to defend Islam. We start to give all these examples of how Quran doesn't say this or the prophet didn't do this. Uh, and that in itself is very problematic. Because this is too simplistic an understanding of why there is support for fascism and fascist leaders. But I would like you to keep this image in mind because this is generally the image that is used um, by many people to explain why there is support for hate. And now I hand it over to Sami Dosani. And once again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Shiri, um, for that great introduction. We're going to go a little bit um, quickly today because we have quite a lot of ground to cover. The big question that we're, having, we're asking today is why people support fascism. Uh, in particular, there's a problem, right? So I'll, I'll, the, I'll, I'll talk about what the problem is. I'll talk about who uh, the real beneficiaries of the, of, of the sort of fascist tendencies might be. I'll talk about uh, some of the biological appeal of fascism and neo-fascism. Uh, we'll talk a lot about fake news and the role of the media. Uh, and then some insights from anthropology, and lastly, the way forward and some tools we can all use. So the problem in a nutshell is this, right? Life is getting tougher for many people, perhaps for most people in India especially, but even around the world, if we look, standards of living in most countries are sort of leveling off, right? They aren't advancing at the rate that they used to. Um, so at least the rate of improvement is, is falling behind. And of course, inequalities are increasing. So those at the top are consolidating, they're getting richer. And we know from uh, other studies of human nature, we know that we're always looking up. We're always comparing ourselves with other people. And as a result, we probably feel, even people who are doing quite well, don't feel secure, right? Uh, the second problem is that the same people who are, um, who are feeling that life is getting tougher, they are voting for parties and for candidates that may in fact be making their lives tougher, right? you're voting for the one who is actually punishing you, if it, you want to put it in those terms. Now, this isn't a new phenomenon. Uh, Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s had this to say about it. Those who may not be familiar with, with President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, he uh, took over after the assassination of, of JFK, or President Kennedy, and he is actually the one who pushed through a lot of the civil rights uh, legislation that we take for granted these days around um, non-discrimination against African-Americans in the US and other minorities, et cetera. And what he said when he was facing pushback, he said, I'll tell you what's at the bottom of it. If you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, forgive the language, this is the 1960s, yeah? He won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him someone to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Now, as I say, this is a US example, but we have other examples uh, from India. Um, and I'm just going to play a short segment um, of one of our... Uh, peace vigil videos on the same topic, uh, which, as I say, and as I'm playing this, I would ask you to please think through in your own lives and your own stories uh, what you have seen 
that may be analogous to this, that may be similar to this? 20. First contraction ever in more than 40 years. These are the figures. Anyway, the thing is that we are world power now. We have everything. Bullet train, world class malls, smart cities. Where is all, where is all this? Where is all this? On a WhatsApp group, Modi hai to mumkin hai. We see pictures of India's great development every day. Man, we look like Switzerland. Modi, 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 hang on. Modi, hang on. Modi. Hang on, hang on. So Switzerland is number two in human development index. And let me tell you where India stands. India is at number 131 in human development index. Keep your JNU figures to yourself. The world has accepted Modi ji as the best leader in the world. United Nations has declared it and called India world power. No, it hasn't. The human development index is coined by the United Nations only. Okay. It is a UN construct not created by JNU. Oh, well, at least we are better than Pakistan. Or should we not compare ourselves with China or other countries that are better? If you have so many problems with Modi ji, why don't you just go to Pakistan? Bharat Mata ki jai, Modi ji ki jai. You think Pakku can do it? Congress always has his agenda of defaming Modi ji, Pakistani Dalal. What's wrong with you? Why are we talking about Congress or Pakistan? Why are we even talking about Congress or Pakistan? Modi had promised so many economic benefits and has delivered nothing. Talk about that. Where is that 15 lakh he promised for everyone? Where are the jobs he promised? Where is all the, the promises that he made about low price of petrol, low price of cooking gas? Where is all that? I don't have to answer you. My, I'm only answerable to Modi ji, who depends upon my loyalty. You are a part of that Tukre Tukre gang. It is people like you who are destroying India. Modi, 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 Modi. Great. So this was an example from India. And of course, people should feel free to give uh, examples from their own context. Anyone can think of any examples that are similar to this, where people are cheerleading things that really aren't in their own, um, own best interest? Feel free to um, write in the chat if your audio is not working. We would like you to share examples of illogical or irrational conversations you've had with people where things are very clear that you know they are not in the interest okay we have uh, somebody saying nupur the arguments against nrc caa that's correct um so for people who are uh, not aware of what uh, the nrc caa issue is it's a national register in india that was trying to keep non um uh, Hindus, or actually just Muslims, <laughs> out of the citizenship uh, role in in uh, in India. Uh, there's support for Marie, Marie Le Pen in France. Absolutely, the extreme droit has uh, gained a lot of ground due to the same construct. Absolutely, uh, Samir talks fast. This is true. Uh, I need to talk slower. This is very true. Uh, could the situation in Germany during Hitler's time be compared to Modi's situation? Well, yes and no. Of course, if you if you torture, if you sort of examine anything in detail, you will definitely find um, that it's not the same, that it is different. But in one level, people have said that one of the reasons that um, Nazis came to power in the way that they did was because many people did not see the success uh, of the Weimar Republic. So this is the, 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 the post-World War I and pre-World War II period was a time of great inequality you had sort of jazz bands in Berlin and so on, but most people were still, were still very, very poor. Um, and so those economic issues are thought by many historians to have played some role in the appeal for Nazism and certainly in explaining why it went from a very small minority party in say 1920 to winning the election in, I will forget the exact year, but I believe it was 1929 um, or sorry, 1930. 1939 is the invasion, so a few a year before that, 1938, right? Okay, uh, hope that's... But um, I, I think the point here is that, yes, uh, the whole Nazi and fascist pro project that was in, in both the countries, in Germany and Italy, that we're talking about, ultimately did harm 
the majority of people in both those countries. So they supported something that ended up harming uh, the majority of the population, not just uh, Jews or communists. 100%. Thank you so much, Shudi. Your camera is closed, by the way. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's go back here. So that was uh, Lyndon Johnson, and that was some of our own materials on this. Um, so the question I would ask at this point is who are the real targets, right? Uh, we tend to think that if there is a split, right, if the community is being split between black and white or between Hindu and Muslim, then it is the people on top of that hierarchy who are um, the beneficiaries, right? And it's the people at the bottom, so the Muslims in the case of India, who are the targets. But when we examine this a little more closely, we find that actually what's going on is the, the, the governments are never really after the minorities. What they are after is social control of the majority, right? So in the case of India, it is the Hindus who are the real targets of these campaigns. And the way that they are being galvanized is by focusing on targeting a minority, right? So I would argue the real targets are actually the majority populations. And the way that they are being targeted is themselves to target minority populations. That's the first question. And we'll get into this a little bit more detail uh, later, in the, later in the presentation. The second question is what has been the outcome, right? So when we look at any, uh, any instance of violence, right? Uh, often there is a, so let's take a recent um, unfortunate beheading uh, of someone uh, by someone who happened to be Muslim, I mean, by a criminal element. Um, so when we look at those kind of events, one has to ask, okay, what is the outcome here? The outcome is that, um, you know, anti-Muslim sentiment in the country has been galvanized, has been, uh, so I would urge us to see these kind of events, not just as legal events, which they are, of course they are, there must be a rule of law, there must be, criminals must be held accountable for their acts, right? Uh, but they are also political events in that they play into a certain narrative, which fr frankly is not the dominant narrative in the country, right? Minority versus majority is never the dominant narrative in any country. There's always lots and lots of things going on and there's always majorities and minorities involved in both sides, right? So the qu second question is, what is the outcome? The third question is who has been making money through all this. And here I'll just um, point out a couple of things that uh, when Modi came to power in 2014, there was a guy called Gautam Adani who was straight away given some contracts. He's a Gujarati businessman. Um, most of us didn't know who he was. In fact, I used to get his name confused with uh, Ambani, who's another one of the world's richest people. Uh, but he's gone from essentially a no one, like a small time business person, um, to Asia's richest person. His net worth is $99.2 billion, making him the sixth richest person in the world. His personal wealth is roughly equivalent to the GDP of Kenya. Okay, so the next question becomes this. If you tell people you want to consolidate, so this is a quote from Mussolini. Uh, what Mussolini said, and, and you can look at his writings, they're actually quite informative on these topics. Um, fascism, Mussolini, everyone will remember, was the um, fascist leader of Italy during World War II, and he was a champion of fascism even before World War II. And he said fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it is a merger of state and corporate power, right? Uh, so the question is this, if you tell people, if you tell people this, so if, if Mussolini was at least brave enough to tell people that that was his agenda, uh, but these days, if you do that, if you say, hey, if you come up to me and say, hey, I wanna take all your money and all of your rights, uh, no one is gonna do it right? You'd be a fool. I'd be a fool to say, oh, great. Take my money. Take my rights. No problem. So how do you make people do it? And here's where we get into the biology of things. Um, so on this slide, we have uh, one explanation of the human nervous system. The human nervous system, everyone will remember from biology school and uh, biology in their grade school. Uh, we have the brain, which is the biggest organ of the nervous system, but you actually have nerves in every single part of your body, right? And we, these nerves by and large are, I mean, there's different ways to classify them. One way to classify the nervous system is that it has two stages, two modes, right? It has an on off switch, if you wanna think about it that way. Uh, and it has the parasympathetic nervous system, which is also called rest and digest, right? 
And here you can see some of what happens uh, physiologically, right? Uh, we are salivating because we can eat, right? Uh, we are digesting, right? We are not producing adrenal, uh, adrenal hormones, which is cortisol and so on, because we don't need to run away, right? We don't need to run away from everything. We feel relaxed, right? Uh, another way to think about this that some doctors also say is you're, you're smoking and joking, right? You're just, just relaxing, having a good time, right? And the other part of this, so let's say you're relaxing, having a good time, and suddenly uh, there's um, someone with a knife who shows up in front of you, or there's a, some kind of a wild cat or a wolf or something. What happens immediately? All these things happen. You stop salivating, right? You increase the heartache, right? Your uh, lungs open up so that you can maximize oxygen to your lungs in case you need to run away quickly, right? This is called fight or flight, right? Fight or flight stance, sometimes called fight, flight, or freeze, because these are the three reactions that we have, right? Okay. All right, can people hear me okay? So, uh, so what happens, for example, when we've lost uh, someone we love? Uh, I don't really know how to, how to fix that. Um, okay, so what happens, for example, when we've lost someone we love? When we have any kind of, of traumatic experience, the body is going to go into this fight or flight state. It's going to look for support. It's going to look for strength. It's going to look for strong community as well. So the things that we do within the body, but because humans are social beings, we look straight away for support to, to the community as well. I don't know how to, I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. We look straight to the community as well for support. And historically, and even right now, this manifests itself in the desire for a strong man, I would argue, right? So um, in the old days, it may have been the leader of the tribe. Uh, we've been in patriarchal societies for a long time. So often this is a man, although not always, but mostly, right? Um, and sometimes it's actually the same person who caused the problem, directly or indirectly. Um, and here we can go back to India. So we have stories, many of, many of us have our own personal stories or we've been told stories of people in India, for example, in Uttar Pradesh in the biggest state of India, which had about a year ago in May, June of 2021, had some of the worst results uh, in the COVID pandemic that have been seen anywhere in the world, right? So many people may have lost loved ones directly as a consequence of the BJP COVID policies, right? Now, what happened after that, there was an election a few months ago where the BJP came back into power. And it's difficult to know because, you know, one needs to do a lot of research and polling and, and it's not so easy to do that. We don't necessarily have all that data, but we have some anecdotes. So there's a friend of mine who, whose husband, or actually the, the father, um, the man's father was killed um, in, due to basically ineptitude, right? There wasn't enough uh, oxygen cylinders. There wasn't enough equipment. The man, like many thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, he died during that time, May, June, 2021. What happened after that, in the trauma, this man and his mother, in other words, the wife of the person who died, they become strong BJP supporters. They weren't necessarily before. Now, why is that? The same government that has, in some ways, robbed them of their family member, they are now supporting that. Well, there are other things that are happening as well, right? So one thing that the government did was it, it gave food rations to everyone. So you could get, I won't remember exactly how many kilos, 10 kilos or 50 kilos of rice per month. You get a big, um, a big bag of rice, which is frankly not enough to feed a family anywhere near for a month. So uh, caloric wise, I think I, we did the math. It was something like uh, 600 calories per day um, is what it amounted to. So not a significant uh, help, frankly. But what these bags had was they had a picture of Narendra Modi on every single bag. So what you have done, you have associated the strong man with food, right? Uh, whether that is um, conscious or subconscious, that will increase or that could increase the tendency to gravitate towards the strong man in this time of crisis. Okay. And the strong man doesn't just come with strength, right? He comes with his own narrative, right? Um, he comes with what has been termed, um, unfortunately, Donald Trump has made this famous, but it's long before um, Donald Trump, it becomes an issue. You have fake news, right? 
Now, in this context, I don't just mean, you know, misreporting or I don't just mean, um, you know, one can say, for example, uh, I can get things wrong. I can say um, 400 people were killed in Godra in the, the, two, in the 2002 um, massacre in Godra, for example, when in fact it may have been 300 or something like that. That's a mistake. That is in some sense, if you want to call it fal false news, that's wrong. But that's not really what I'm talking about here. Because what the strongman comes with, whether the strongman is Trump or Modi or whoever, the strongman comes with a whole narrative about the world which has an appeal. Now, the, obviously, the narrative is not true, but that's not the important part of the narrative, right? What is that narrative? It, it captures the imagination. You know, so make America great again, right? Make in India. And then we have this talk you saw in the video before, smart cities, super highways development. Where is that development happening? No one knows. But it becomes a slogan. It becomes a thought. Um, and, and it becomes uh, part of the sort of thinking of a certain segment of people. Um, and it even goes this far, right? So you have, you know, you have fringe elements and, and we um, sort of progressive people, people on, on the left, we love to make fun of these kind of headlines when they show up, right? So we have Hindu nationalists claiming that ancient Indians had airplanes, stem cells, technologies, and the internet, right? Um, so, so, you know, we like to make fun of it and obviously it should be making, made fun of, but that's not really the point, you know? Um, the reality of it is not the point. The point is that, you know, think in someone's mind, can you imagine under the ancient Hindu kings, there used to be internet, right? And it took us 2000 years to, to find that again. So if we go back to something like the Hindu kingdom, maybe we can have even more. All of my dreams can be fulfilled, right? That is the subtext, that is the implication that often we, I would describe us as sort of rationalists. We don't pay enough attention to that subtext. Okay. Yeah, I know, I understand. Better? Yeah. Okay, so this is related uh, to something here. And here's, here's an, another exercise for everyone. So I'd ask everyone to ask, uh, ask yourself, what is one thing you wish for from the past that you didn't experience but had been told existed? For example, having a cook. So uh, I'm gonna tell you a story to illustrate this point. Um, there is a story in a book called The Other Side of Silence by Urvashi Butalia, a very great book written now more than 30 years ago about post-partition experience. Um, so in this book, uh, Butalia, she is a, a Punjabi and she goes, her family migrated from Pakistan. She goes back um, to the familial house in Pakistan to meet her. I won't remember if it's her mama or her chacha, her, brother's, her, her father's brother or her sister's uh, mother's brother um, who was still living in that house. He, he tried to keep the ancestral property. He converted to Islam. Now, this person has a very interesting story because he is wishing for something that he has never seen. He left his whole family to stay where he was. He has never been outside of the territory that is today Pakistan, but his imagination, his longing, his desire was for a place in India to be with his family that he'd never seen, right? In Punjabi, we call this Vatan, right? His Vatan was in Delhi with his family but he only has ever lived in the area near, near Lahore, right? He doesn't know Delhi. So is there anything like that you can think of where you're, you're longing for something that frankly may never have existed? So here, if I could just come in and say that um, I would really encourage our interns and volunteers to speak at this point. Most of you are very young. Um, there are three uh, um, interns and volunteers on this call. If you'd like to relate any incident or any, um, you know, conversations in your family um, that relate to what Sami is talking about, nostalgia, uh, you know, something that doesn't exist today, but you have been told it was great, uh, it did exist in the past, and that somehow you hold on to it thinking, oh, that is part of my heritage or part of my identity. So do come in here, interns, don't be shy. If you raise your hand, I will give you permission to speak. Otherwise, you can feel free also to put your thoughts in the chat. Um, what we are describing here, as Shuni has said, is called nostalgia, right? Okay, it's okay. Uh, no one's speaking right now. If something comes to your mind, feel free to put it in a chat. Actually, Samira has written here, the family compound. Extended family living together, communal eating, cooking, etc. Thank you, Samira. Um, 
Anybody else? Uh, like, like I'll, I'll give you an example. I have an aunt who used to tell me that the door in her house was so thick, uh, made of wood, uh, that you could make four or five beds out of it. It was so thick. I've never seen this door. But uh, her whole thing was that the houses, they were so strong, nobody could enter or destroy them. I have never seen such houses. I myself had, um, a, um, you know, an experience where my house was broken into in South Africa. I wish I had that door uh, that my aunt had. <laughs> never saw it, but that door would have prevented the robbers from getting in for sure. Uh, anyone else? We can also keep this in mind. And if people have thoughts, they can put them in the chat and we can get back to them, yeah? Um, Samina Mukhtar says, the patriarch that took care of everybody. Yes, that's, uh, this is also, some of us also had matriarchs in the family history who took care, care of everybody, absolutely. So what I would say is that, you know, ideally what, what happens or what happens ideally or not is that we move from a personal reality. So this is something, for example, that family patriarch or whatever it may be, or matriarch, there's usually an individual, right? It was my dada, it was my pardada, it was my grandfather, it was my great-grandfather who played that role. But the fact is, when you say that, everyone sort of has that archetype, right? It, it's almost a collective consciousness. So we can move from, from the, the personal to, the, um, to the, the social very easily. And these kind of uh, narratives, so is it still messed up over there? Okay. Um, how about, and, uh, how about now? Is that better? Yes. And here Radhika has written, so the narrative is not just about harking back to the glory days of India. It is also that outsiders, meaning Mughals and British in this case, came and took everything away. Else we would have been a great country. That's a very good point, uh, Radhika. So we're here we are talking of the collective nostalgia, especially created um, to galvanize people around an idea, say, in this case, Hindutva, but it could be other things as well. 100%, 100%. So what I would say, and, and um, was it Radhika who made that last comment? Yes. Um, what Radhika is sort of taking us to is the next point, which is that these narratives, they create an alternative reality in the imagination of marginalized people, right? So reality sucks. And we see this even in, in middle-class countries like the US or whatever it may be. Reality is no good. I'm working two jobs just to survive, whatever it may be. I get home, I turn on the television. It's an escapist fantasy, right? Um, in the same way, uh, that nostalgia, that collective nostalgia, and of course the television can play a role here, um, it, it's, it, it plays that role. It, it, gives us, it gives us a sense of, of belonging and it also presses those buttons. So when we're watching TikTok videos or whatever it may be, we get this massive hit of dopamine, right? Um, and that dopamine rush is also available just by, just by thinking sort of nostalgic talk, thoughts, right? I'm thinking about my, you know, the, the house that my daddy lived in in 1980 that I can barely rem remember. I was four years old. But just by thinking about it, I can begin to get a hit of dopamine. I make myself feel good. So it's, it's, a, it's in some ways, this is an answer to the problem of, the excessive fight or flight, right? Because you can't have someone in a sympathetic state. So remember, remember in the earlier slide, sympathetic is the fight or flight state. You cannot be functional and be in that state all the time, right? So the way the right-wing ideology works is you get the people when they're in the fight or flight state, but in order to keep them, you have to give them some, some carrots, right? You have to give them some peace, right? And blaming Muslims, blaming the Mughals, blaming whoever else, thinking about this fictional kingdom that never existed, blaming black people, blaming Indian people, blaming whatever you like, right? That, that gives us, or that gives those people the relaxing, the dopamine hit, the, the parasympathetic hit as well, right? Okay, so um, with that said, I'd like to go to the realm of anthropology and talk a little bit about human conflict and uh, tribalism. So there's a question, um, about are we, are humans tribal, right? And um, the answer, the short answer is yes. Let me give a slightly longer answer. Um, in the longer answer, what we will say is this. We'll say that um, there is something called Dunbar's number, which you can see on this screen. Um, and you know, this was developed about 50 years ago. 
the thinking was that there's a limit to the number of social connections that people can have, right? Now, people are challenging if this is a real thing in the era of people having, you know, 5,000 Facebook friends and 20,000 Twitter followers or whatever. But even then, it is, it is kind of a real thing. Uh, Dunbar himself put the number at 150. Others, um, I, would, I would myself would put it at maybe double that, maybe, you know, 290 or 300. But there is a cutoff is the point. So whenever we look in, in history, so I'm talking about ancient history, um, and when we see societies that sort of grow beyond, especially uh, societies that are very close-knit societies, like hunter-gatherer societies, we see that beyond a certain number, they will just break off. If you have 300, 400 people in a group, that group will not be stable for long. Some part of it, it'll probably split in half. It, both halves will probably be led by a kind of a, a strongman kind of a person. And the new group will often be hostile towards the old group. The new group will often establish a language that is different than the old group's language. This is one reason that people, uh, you know, the most linguistically diverse places on earth are not necessarily the places you would expect, right? Papua New Guinea, I won't remember the exact figure, but it has more than 100 or, or 200 language groups represented just in a very small geographical area and not a very densely populated one, right? Some places in, in Africa as well uh, have the same kind of linguistic diversity. It's because people break off and they sort of start their new languages or, and often getting influenced by even other uh, outside languages as well. So uh, to some extent, tribalism is built into us. So what we might call tribalism, it's a bit of a pejorative term. Forgive me for using it in this way, but it, you, go, you know what I mean, this sort of group thing, the idea that we have to be defined in opposition to another community, it, to some extent that is built into us. The question then becomes, how can we use this tendency? So how do we use those tribalist tendencies to our advantage? And by our, I mean people who are dedicated to the cause of peace and justice um, and equality and so on, right? Are there ways we can build communities that are inclusive, that are multiracial, that are welcoming? Uh, we have some examples, uh, both good and bad examples that we'll talk about. And most communities do involve some form of othering, but I would argue that doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Now on the bad side and maybe on the good side as well, we have this example here, which is um, you know, the, the defining point of many of our lives, I, I imagine, which is the 9-11 the um, attacks that took place. This is the World Trade Center. You can't see it at all uh, in the process of falling, I believe. So uh, those attacks, uh, you know, vicious attack, killing innocent people. It took place at a time when the president of the United States, so this is George W. Bush, he was a laughing stock, right? The headline, the newspapers were carrying headlines about how he was playing golf almost every day. Um, no one was taking him seriously at all. Even people on the right wing weren't really taking him seriously, right? What happened after 9-11? Immediately, those same voices, and I heard this from my own family and friends, the exact same voices who were making fun of the president the day before 9-11 were rallying to his defense the day after, right? And I should remind you that this, the actual things that happened during 9-11 were pretty, uh, that the president and the vice president did and so on, they're pretty cowardly. I mean, they basically went hiding for cover and didn't really show any leadership at all, right? Instead of being attacked, there were people rallied around, right? So that goes back to earlier discussions around fight or flight, around the sympathetic nervous system, um, and around rallying around that strongman or looking for a strongman, no matter how inadequate the strongman may be, right? Uh, some people were also, you know, venting their fight uh, instincts, right? So anyone who looked like a Muslim, quote unquote, uh, was actually being, was being, was in danger of being shot, right? And there were a number of killings at petrol pumps and so on, mostly of people who were Sikhs um, because, um, yeah, uneducated. Well, I, I mean, not that it would have been better to kill Muslims, but uh, it's unfortunate that, that Sikhs, because they visibly wear a turban, are often ad uh, more identifiable as, as minorities <laughs> and therefore more targeted. Other things also happened at the time of 9-11. So we have communities that got together, communities that were supporting each other. Firefighters uh, rushed into buildings that were toppling down. Uh, later, some of those people got together and fought for compensation that they eventually won from the US government uh, for putting their lives at risk and also for breathing in noxious fumes, right? So this was a good side. Uh, but ultimately what comes out of the deaths of thousands of innocent people in New York, the deaths of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of innocent people in Afghanistan, Iraq, maybe even Libya. So fear of the other, rallying around the leader, the march to war, 
this is sort of the predictable consequences of that fight or flight instinct being, um, being engaged. Now in India at the moment, similar things are happening. I don't wanna call them identical, uh, but similar things are happening. And um, Muslims are largely the, uh, the scapegoat, right? So the anti-Muslim sentiment, it's important to remember that the anti-Muslim sentiment has been part of Indian political life since the time of the British, right? You can go back uh, on our YouTube page and look for a, a lecture that Harbans Mukia gave about a year and a half ago, explaining that the first communal riots, so the first Hindu-Muslim violence, happens at almost exactly the same time that the British East India com uh, Company, so in other words, the British come into power, right? Um, and so uh, this is not new. This is divide and rule. The British did it wherever they were in charge, but it was extremely effective in the Indian context, and it became, I would argue, a founding principle of the quote unquote, Gujarat development model, right? That Narendra Modi, you know, came to power in the national level for saying that he was promoting a Gujarat development model. That was a kind of an apartheid model, right? All the Muslims need to get out of the way, be stuck into a ghetto, um, and then the rest of us will sort of develop. Um, so that's the governance model that has been exported or is currently being exported to the rest of the country. Okay. Um, Okay, so getting back to this uh, idea of tribalism. So, you know, there's a way to define this. Uh, I would say that there's a, there's a way to define this that's positive, right? So there are, um, okay. Um, sorry about the technical issues, guys. This is a little bit strange. Is that better, Shudi? Okay. Um, so I would say, look, at, an, at a daily level, people are constantly working outside their tribalism, if you like to think about it that way, right? Um, huge, you know, if you look at, say, a cricket match or a football match in the States or whatever, you will find people of every gender, every color, every religious persuasion coming together. Um, and what brings those people together? It's, it's an emotional involvement. Uh, it's what we can call pathos. Um, Right, you can look at also at, at examples of people who, um, you know, um, people who have very uplifting stories. Right, so we have the story of, for example, uh, Rachel Corey, you know, a, a North American person from Seattle, I believe, or Washington State, who was murdered by um, by Israelis uh, before stopping a bulldozer. The bulldozer just ran right over her. Right, so we have these very powerful stories that could. Uh, we have even uh, going back to the freedom movement time. You have the stories of the Salt March, such fantastic stories and such fantastic storytelling. Uh, the problem, and those stories are what can bring people together. So again, they bring people together on a football field. The right wing is using those stories, again, the fictionalized stories um, to bring people together. What I would say is that we uh, progressives, people who are looking for, for peace, we have also stories. The problem is that we tend to overanalyze those stories sometimes, right? So I gave the example of Gandhi's uh, Salt March which is a very interesting story. And, you know, I can tell that story. And maybe five years ago, if a young person had asked me, I would have told them the story in a lot of detail. I mean, I, you know, Shirin has taught me a lot about uh, the life of Gandhi and some of these big events and so on. So I could tell it in a lot of detail. But the problem is I would go immediately from the storytelling to the analysis and say, look, this was the weakness. This was the strength. This is why they were able to go forward. And I'm not saying that analysis doesn't play a role. But if we're trying to maximize the emotion, if we're trying to maximize the pathos, then going straight to the analytical mind, because the analytical mind, uh, you know, is, is a different kind of a mind. Uh, so it's not helpful. So you introduce pathos with these great stories, and then immediately you turn it off by saying, okay, what can we, how can we analyze this? Um, another thought is that we need... Uh, Samir, I, I would just like to bring in the case of slavery here. Uh, there are uh, people joining uh, from the U.S. right now who know a lot about this whole discourse on slavery that um, has revived in the last few years. And I'd like to point out that um, both in the United States and in Europe, many, many white people supported the anti-slavery um, movement. And um, that is something that's a very powerful narrative that can be put forward, but we often don't do that. Um, I see it as a big weakness. Well, well, what do you think? 
No, 100%. I think these are very good examples. And there's another book that we can recommend on the end of the transatlantic slave trade and the somewhat odd coalitions that were formed to make that happen. That is a book called Bury the Chains by someone called Adam Hochschild. Uh, he is most famous for writing the book King Leopold's Ghost. Um, I believe it was the book immediately after that called Bury the Chains um, that goes over the story from the European perspective uh, in a lot of detail and it's very interesting. Uh, so that said, you know, what I think we can have a discussion about redefining what it means to be tribal, understanding that we're not going to get rid of those instincts altogether. But can we create sort of inclusive tribes? So there are certain tribes that are exclusivist, but may not, that may not be a problem in the sense that, you know, I may belong to the tribe of Christians or I may belong to the tribe of Muslims or Hindus or whatever. That's almost inescapable. Um, but in addition to that, and this is why this slide I'm showing, there are layers of identity. So in addition to my identity as a, as a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever, I could also have an identity as part of the tribe that talks to people who are not like us, right? I can be part of the tribe that has friends from every culture, and I can be part of the, the tribe that dis respects diversity, respects love, respects justice, right? Who elevates these principles, right? Um, and in some ways, I mean, in fairness, in some ways, that is the sort of fairy tale version of the United States that I fell in love with as a little boy, right, in the 1970s and 80s, um, and began to resent as soon as I understood that that wasn't really the United States, right? So the idea that everyone is welcome, no matter their beliefs or their status, the idea that everyone is respected, the idea that with enough hard work, anyone can succeed, forget the last bit because it's, that's a whole different discussion, but the idea of communities based on inclusivity should not be alien to us. And what I will say there is that in, in the Indian context, this is also very true, right? So we have the example of these, um, whoops, let me do it properly. Um, so we have the idea of multi-ethnic communities, which are rooted in the freedom movement, uh, which was a chance to struggle against something. So it was a struggle against the British, it was a struggle against colonialism, but it was also a, a struggle for something. So the people who were fighting the British were committed to a united, multi-faith, multi-caste movement, right? And someone will point out, and maybe not on this call, but in other talks that I've given, there'll always be someone who'll say, no, 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 look at Savarkar, look at some of these people, um, Jinnah and so on, who were openly preaching sectar sectarianism. And what I would say is that the people who were openly preaching sectarianism, whether Hindu or Muslim, were not part of the movement. They were pro-British, they weren't anti-British. And Professor Shamsul Islam, who may be on the call right now, uh, he's done a lot of work to document this point, right? How we build this community that is based on, you know, we are the tribe of people who respect diversity. We are the tribe of people who, who respect peace. We are the tribe of people who talk. We are not part of the tribe of people who fight, right? Uh, so how we build that community is a task that maybe we've been failing at since the time of independence. Uh, and, you know, that maybe there's certain things we can say, maybe we shouldn't take too much blame for that. The other side has money. The other side can, side can mobilize public support by appealing to that fight or fight instinct that we discussed previously. But I would say that in future, we need to do much better at this. And we have some concrete ideas in terms of how we can do better at this. So those ideas include, so like I said, the other side is mobilizing us on the lines of this fight or flight. They, they, they tap into the sympathetic nervous system, and then they give you a narrative to get you out of there. They, they, they create a hell for you, and then they tell you the way out of hell, right? The hell is, oh my God, everyone's gonna come to get me. The moguls are coming, gonna come. Uh, this guy, what's, um, Jinnah, uh, not Jinnah, sorry. Um, um, Nehru, right? Nehru and Gandhi, right? Nehru and Indira Gandhi, people who are long dead. <laughs> they are the enemies, they're gonna come and get us, right? Um, and in order to save yourself from Nehru, this is the way, right? Uh, so they're giving us that narrative. We need to give, we need to short circuit that narrative and give a better narrative. So what can we say? We can say that facts are not enough. Um, we also need, uh, we need to understand that they are hacking into human biology and we need a way to short circuit that. In previous talks, we've talked about the role of humor and how that can really um, play that role. But there's also pathos, as I mentioned here. There's nostalgia of our own. So when we talk about the freedom movement, you know, I'm not saying that we have to be 100% accurate with our description of the freedom movement. We should be mostly accurate to the extent that's possible, but accuracy is less important than that 
pathos, that emotional, that longing for a, a, a place where no one has to fear for their life, right? Uh, as Shirin said, there were white people who helped uh, slaves, there were white people in the anti-slavery movement and so on. So those kind of stories of people, right now the majority of people in prison uh, for being in solidarity with Muslims, uh, I believe the vast majority of them are Hindus, right? Which perhaps is not a, not a surprise because the vast majority of the population are Hindus. Um, but it says something that uh, Mr. Bhatt and uh, Ms. Setelvad and all of these people who happen to be Hindus by birth uh, are the ones who are on the front lines, who are putting their bodies on the line, who are going to prison for the rights of Muslims and other minorities, right? Um, the third thing to say is that we have limited resources. So in order to maximize those resources, we need to repeat the message again and again. Uh, it is a quote from Hitler that is it better to have a few messages that are often repeated than to have many, many messages that are right, right? So we need a, we need a few coordinated messages that we need to repeat uh, as often as possible in as many uh, fora as possible. And we ourselves need to have uh, multicultural gatherings. We need to be creating those alternative tribes, those tribes based on inclu inclusivity, those tribes that only ex exclude people who exclude. Uh, this was a slogan we used to say in the meetings, uh, the, the meetings I was part of in the 19, um, 1990s, would say, look, everyone is welcome into this space, except those who don't welcome everyone else. So if you are openly racist, if you are sexist, if you are homophobic, whatever it may be, you are not welcome in the space. But everyone else, which is most of us, right? Most of us are, will need to talk with whoever. Everyone else is more than welcome. Uh, so with that, I will close this part of the, the session and we can move on to uh, question and answer.